for The Life of the World is a production of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. Visit us online at faith.yale.edu. This episode was made possible in part by Blueprint 1543, integrating Christian theology and the sciences to answer life's biggest questions. For more information, visit blueprint1543.org. Patience is negatively correlated with depressed symptoms. So people who have this character strength of patients actually do have lower depressive symptoms in that population. To the extent that people increase in their life hardships, patients in particular, they actually also decrease in their depressive symptoms, whereby patience is almost an antidote <laughs> to some of the depression symptoms. And we found though that when people were high in gratitude or high in life hardships patients, they could still be struggling existentially, but not experience that suicide risk. And it seems that the patients and the gratitude help them to still see life as worth living, even though they're struggling with its meaning, which I think is just really cool and gives another point of intervention. This is For the Life of the World a podcast about seeking and living a life worthy of our humanity. I'm Ryan mcnally Lenz with the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. There's a tension, an ambivalence in our culture when it comes to patience. There's this mountain of proverbs that lifts patience up as essential to wisdom. They're the kinds of thing you might hear from a wise elder when you're frustrated or impetuous. Good things come to those who wait. We hear haste makes waste. We're reminded that a wash pot never boils and that Rome wasn't built in a day. Hurry up and wait. You've got to walk before you can run. But that seasoned folk wisdom is often at odds with the youthful speed of worldly polished wisdom that values action, movement, efficiency, future orientation, the technological cutting edge and getting things done. The fact is we have no time for patience. Impatience is a virtue. When you know what you want, waiting isn't an option. Contrast the frenetic suggestion that waiting is not an option with what theological ethicist David Bailey Harned called the slowness of the good. Harned points out that since the Industrial Revolution, patients have simply gone out of style. This is the fifth episode of a six-part series on patience, why it's so hard, what's good about it, and how we might cultivate it. We began by tracing some of the cultural and economic symptoms of the decline of patience in modern life, the loss of time as sacred, and the temptation to view time as money and nothing more. We explored how God's patience enables human action and examined the moral structure of patience as a virtue which moderates not just waiting, busyness, and hurry, but the sorrow and pain that lurk beneath those symptoms. We've considered patience with the help of ethics, theology, and philosophy, and now we're going to come at it through psychology. Today, research psychologist Sarah Schnitker of Baylor University joins me to talk about how to measure patients scientifically, how that helps to fashion behavioral interventions that can make us more patient, and how patience plays a role in a life that feels good and goes well. She reflects on the significance of applying psychological research methods to theological and moral concepts. She shares about the specific studies of patients that she's conducted. And finally, she offers practical steps that we can take to maybe become more patient. Thanks for listening, friends. Sarah, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. I wanted to get started by asking you if you have any thoughts about what the psychological study of patients can offer our particular cultural moment. And maybe another way of asking that question is, why have you devoted some time to it? Let me tell the story maybe of how I first got into patients. So as a graduate student, I worked with Bob Emmons at UC Davis and really got into understanding positive psychology, how... Um, virtues are cultivated also in religious contexts. I noticed <laughs> very quickly that there was a certain virtue that was really spoken about in a lot of traditional virtue theory that was noticeably absent in positive psychology in particular, and that was patience. Most of the virtues that we're really focused on, like gratitude or um, hope or joy or these kind of things, much more 
assertive, active virtues <laughs> where you go out and do things. But patience was notably absent as a virtue that relates to how we suffer and can we suffer well. And I read a book by David Bailey Harned, a moral philosopher, and he argued that patience had gone out of style in Christianity since the Industrial Revolution and had only gotten worse and worse, that instead of seeing suffering as a part of life that we have to deal with somehow, we can either embrace it, we can avoid it, but it's there and it's a reality that's always there. With our technological innovations, humans have decided we can actually eradicate suffering. <laughs> and so the problem of suffering was not how to suffer well anymore, but how to get rid of it completely. And I think that's only been the case more so in the last 20 years. We really we have this idea that we can get rid of it. Now, it's, it's striking that you tied patients so directly to suffering as the starting point. And it, it makes sense when we think about the etymological roots of the word in Latin. But can you explain a little bit off the cuff, the first thing we tend to think of when we think of patients now is waiting. And we don't necessarily immediately think of waiting as a form of suffering. So could you lay out that connection? Yeah. So, right. We do often just think of waiting in line or <laughs> waiting for your internet to speed up or things like that. But I think it's deeper than that. I think waiting is experienced for many people as a form of suffering. And actually, some of the research in psychology suggests it's the uncertain waiting periods that can be most psychologically stressful. So I can research on people who are anticipating layoffs in their company, for instance you find their stress levels are actually highest when they're waiting to figure out if they're getting laid off. Once they know, they actually are much calmer <laughs> and now know what to do. So that waiting period is tough. And I think patience, though, is much deeper than just waiting for things. The etymological root suggests that. I always picture this kind of mind picture of a person bearing a heavy burden and really for the sake of something beyond the self, whether that be other people, one's faith, whatever it may be that it's suffering well. And our research really does support this. So in some of the early studies of patients, we find there's three kind of main types of patients. Daily hassles patients, which is the first thing we typically think of. But then the two other factors that emerged were interpersonal patients. So when other people are causing frustration or adversity or suffering, or you have to wait on others, that would be the interpersonal patients. And then the third factor is this life hardships patients of dealing with things that might persist for a very long time, a chronic illness, or maybe a mental illness in particular, and symptoms that you have, or dealing with, let's say, structural racism over the course of one's life, that dealing with these long-term life hardships becomes highly predictive of well-being. And in our research, it's the interpersonal patients and the long-term kind of life hardships patients that are most predictive of depressive symptoms, other psychological distress and well-being. Whereas the daily hassles patients seems to be important, but not actually important as those other two. Can you walk us through a little bit, like one of the first challenges of doing psychological research on something like patients, which is a longstanding term with a long history of use and of philosophical and theological reflection, is that you need to figure out a way to make something studyable out of that. You need to find where do you get your empirical access to it. And so can you walk us through, when you talk about patients, when you research it, what do you think you're observing? Yes. What do you think it is that, that falls under that term and that you can make claims about as an empirical researcher? Yep. That's our bread and butter is how to operationalize things as psychologists. And it's been fun too, trying to work with philosophers or theologians. Um, we've done some work with Tim Paul this year. Cutter Calloway has often been a conversation partner as well. Or Anne Jeffrey, right? Just thinking about, okay, this is what patience from philosophy means, but what does that actually look like <laughs> in a real human being? How do we measure it? And so there's a couple different approaches we have. Our early work really started just with a very face valid approach of kind of asking people, are you a patient person? <laughs> can you wait with other people or can you withstand suffering without too much distress? And it's interesting, this approach actually seems to work for patients better than some of the other virtues. Patience is not as socially desirable as something like love or gratitude 
um, or kindness. So when you measure those virtues, there tends to be <laughs> um, problems that everyone thinks they're good at them. Whereas patience, it actually comes out a beautiful normal distribution around the mean because it isn't as valued, I think, socially right now in this particular cultural context. So people are very willing to admit, ah, oh, I struggle with this. So that actually makes things a lot easier. So we can use more kind of easy methods of just asking people. But another approach we've been taking is, and this is with one of my grad students, Juliet Ratchford, as well as a previous student, Ryan Thomas, thinking about the idea that a lot of our virtues, we use them in the pursuit of goals in life, that we are trying to do things on a daily basis and achieve things in our lives and that we can pursue those goals virtuously with more virtue or with less. And so this works really well for patients in particular, where we ask, okay, let's think about the specific goals you're trying to achieve. So I'm trying to be a good parent, or I'm trying to write this many papers this year as an academic or whatever it may be. I'm trying to be a person who loves God with my whole heart, right? We have lots of different kinds of goals. And what we ask is that people list the goals that are most important to them right now that they're working on, and then ask them questions about each of those goals. So my goal to be a good parent, are you patient in the pursuit of this goal? Do you find yourself overwhelmed with anxiety or other negative emotions that you end up withdrawing from it or different things like that? So we're trying to be more contextual in how we assess patients. And this seems to be a pretty useful approach right now, that there is ways that people pursue all their goals somewhat similarly, but then there's some real uniqueness as well with particular kinds of goals or particular goals that they have. And there can be action <laughs> at that specific goal level. And so we published one paper a couple of years ago where we actually looked at goals across time so this was with college undergraduates using this method. And we had them list 10 goals they were working on for their quarter of the school year. And we had them go back and rate those same goals every two weeks. And we looked at a variety of factors. So how patient they were in the pursuit of those goals, how much effort they were exerting, how much meaning they found in that goal. And then also how satisfied they were with their progress. And so we were able to do really fancy statistics <laughs> and look at goals nested within people across these five measurement occasions. And what we found is, was really exciting that patients actually facilitated goal pursuit, that when people were patient at one point, two weeks later, they actually exerted more effort on their goals, were more satisfied and ascribed more meaning to them. And then there were also reciprocal interactions with some of those variables, but that was a really important study. I think a lot of people are suspicious of patients <laughs> in this culture. So they think, oh, if you're a patient, you're going to be a doormat or you're never going to get anything done if you're a patient. I don't know if right, this resonates, but yeah, I think a lot yeah, of people yeah. are very suspicious. So we wanted to see, is that the case or just patients being able to regulate your emotions yet still stick with the goal. <laughs> Patients actually facilitates the goal pursuit. It doesn't hinder it. It allows you to stay calm. <laughs> it allows you um, to make decisions instead of just madly doing whatever your emotions tell you to do. And it allows you to persist through difficulties. So we were really excited about that study to show actually patience is a good thing, not just for your health and well-being, but actually for your pursuit of goals and being satisfied with your goal pursuit. So one place where I'm particularly suspicious of patients is in a kind of social deployment of it, where we might try to emphasize people becoming more patient in ways that would squelch sort of justified complaint over injustice of one sort or another. And so you, you may or may not have any thoughts about this particular direction, but that seems potentially encouraging to me that you might not have to make that trade off. There might be ways of cultivating patients that wouldn't necessarily be pushing towards a, a kind of social and political quietism. Yes, we've thought about that quite a bit. We have some data to speak to it. We don't want to tell people, oh, you just need to wait a bit. I mean, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. talked about this, right? That 
telling people, oh, just wait a little longer. It's going to take time for social justice to come through. You need to go slow. That is not what patience is doing. What patience is doing is allowing the person to stay calm (laughs) and be level-headed as they pursue goals of justice and equity and things like that. And it's quite interesting, actually. So in one study, we measured assertiveness. So behavioral assertiveness in particular of telling people when (laughs) you needed something and standing up for something that was wrong. It was really interesting. We found in that study that there was no correlation between patience and assertiveness. It was pretty much near zero, which is not very common. So that means... You can be, yeah, you could be patient and assertive. They're not related. You could be patient and assertive. You could be patient and really low in assertiveness. You could be very assertive and not at all patient. So these are really two completely independent dimensions. And that's encouraging to me that if you're becoming a doormat, (laughs) it's not because you have too much patience. It's because you don't have enough assertiveness (laughs) and you're lacking in some other virtues. And this, I think, is where kind of the unity of the virtues thesis really comes into play, that patience doesn't dictate that you let people walk all over you. It allows you to tell them no (laughs) and to say stop without being angry or being appropriately angry, let's say it that way, and to do it strategically and for good results and to be able to keep sticking with it. I think patience, yeah, really comes through there. I think another important thing as in my lab, when we think about the virtue of patience, we do adopt kind of Aristotelian golden mean perspective that patience is really the golden mean between recklessness. So I think this is what we typically think of as impatience, like pushing ahead, screaming at your kid, just, I want what I want now. And I'm done with the suffering. I'm going to push hard (laughs) to get out of this, whatever it is. That's one vice related to patience. But the other that we consider is what we call like disengagement, somewhat akin to acedia or kidia from monastic thought, right? just it becomes so overwhelming, the suffering, that you give up on the goal and you just disengage from it completely. And this is a really common, like almost a learned helplessness response. And so patience is what we think really allows you to stay in the goal (laughs) in an emotionally stable way. And I think our research is supporting that more and more. And quite a few of our publications, we do always make a point in the discussion of what we are not saying and that this is not meant to silence people. You can be very patient and be speaking truth and justice. And MLK actually wrote about patience some. And right, nonviolent protest is such an exercise in patience, taking on suffering, willingness to suffer for the sake of the good and for justice. And to do that without violence is so incredibly difficult. But really, his belief was that it would be more effective long term. It's a kind of patience that's also compatible with writing a book called Why We Can't Wait. Yeah. (laughs) Would you mind defining a couple terms for us that you used but you said the unity of the virtues thesis. So what's that? And secondly, you talked about Aristotelian golden mean. So what does Aristotle mean by thinking of virtues as a mean between two extremes? And finally, you referenced this monastic idea of vice, a uh, particular vice called akedia or acedia. And I was hoping you could fill that out. It's not a normal term for us to use these days. No, I, exactly. <laughs> I know. I'm like throwing jargon around. Stop that, scientist. So the first, let's see, unity of the virtues thesis. So by this, the idea here is that you need to have all of the virtues <laughs> in order to be a virtuous person. And also, we see this empirically that people who tend to have one virtue often do tend to have a variety of other virtues. And so here really saying, what's a profile of a person who's virtuous and is recognized as this? And to have patience alone, but not have any love or any gratitude or any sense of justice, that's not actually going to be a virtuous person. 
And that person could actually be very dangerous <laughs> in our society. Someone who's highly patient could be very effective, right? An assassin is extremely patient and sits there and waits to kill someone, but they're not motivated by love and they're not doing this for right reasons. And thinking about that, we need a constellation of virtues for a person to really flourish in this world. So sometimes when we see what looks like a negative effect of a virtue, it might actually be that the person is lacking another virtue, is what we mean by that. The golden mean <laughs> that Aristotle talked about of the virtues. So by this, mm -hmm. meaning that virtues are really this ideal state in that there are two complementary vices for many of the virtues, a vice of excess and a vice of deficiency. And I think this really does make sense for patients. It might not work for all the virtues, but for patients, it really rings true that you can have a deficiency of patience, and that would be that recklessness, that having not enough patience at all. But then an excess of patience is right too much to the point that it's now no longer patience and it's become a problem and no longer an excellence of a human being. We've not done a great job of measuring this in psychology. I think part of the issue is that it's not a numerical mean. <laughs> so, right, it's not like middle level scores on patient scales that we have. That doesn't get at this. So what my team's trying to do is actually measure patients proper, but also measuring the vice of excess and the vice of deficiency alongside of patients and trying to say, okay, here's what the ideal way to do it. Here's where you can go awry in one direction, awry in the other, and using our measurement approach to really show that, yes, this is a person who is patient and is not reckless and is not falling prey to apathy or acedia or disengagement, which then leads us to that term, acedia or acedia. I came across it early in my work and it in relation to patients and just struck a chord with me. Kathleen Norris has an amazing book <laughs> on acedia that really talks about it. And it's almost this ennui, this loss of purpose. And the monastics would talk about it a lot. It's often translated as sloth, but I think that's a term that doesn't make as much sense from my reading. So it's not laziness. <laughs> it's not that you don't work hard. It's more that you've lost your motivation and you've lost that motivation for the good and to really love others. And that really does seem to me a problem of not having patience that things have become too difficult. I think with the pandemic, this is <laughs> something many of us are experiencing of you're in this monotony, you've lost sight of the bigger picture and you just start to languish and disengage from what's important to you. Some people, some folks have noted that some of the symptoms of acedia overlap with the symptoms of depression disorders. And I definitely don't think we want to equate them as the same, but I, there is some family resemblance there uh, that I think is quite interesting. And in some of my research, I've done some work on patients in people who are hospitalized at a psychiatric unit. So with Pine Rest mm -hmm. Mental Health Services in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And these are people who are acutely suffering <laughs> from distress, often at high risk for death by suicide. It's often the reason they're there and very high depressive symptoms. But our work has been really cool with patients. We find patients is negatively correlated with depressive symptoms. So people who have this character strength of patients actually do have lower depressive symptoms in that population. And across the course of treatment, so from intake to discharge, to the extent that people increase in their life hardships patients in particular, they actually also decrease in their depressive symptoms. So there seems to be this relationship there whereby patience is almost an antidote <laughs> to some of the depression symptoms. Um, of course, not the only one. Something like depression has multiple levels at which you need to intervene and using psychopharmacology and all kinds of treatments. But patience does seem to be a strength that we can bring to that. 
And then most interestingly, or most recently, we just got an article accepted in Journal of Personality this last week, looking at how patience and gratitude buffer against ultimate struggles with meaning on suicide risk. So it's very well established that people who are having existential (laughs) struggles with meaning in life lost their purpose. In many ways, some similarities with acedia, that those people are at much higher risk for death by suicide. And in this population of psychiatric inpatients, this is real risk. And we found, though, that when people were high in gratitude or high in life hardships patients, they could still be struggling existentially, but not experience that suicide risk. And it seems that the patience and the gratitude help them to still see life as worth living, even though they're struggling with its meaning, which I think is just really cool and gives another point of intervention. Okay, maybe we can't help resolve these meaning struggles that a person has, but we can teach them to be patient and suffer (laughs) in a way and accept some of that suffering and find strategies for coping with it and find gratitude practices are pretty easy to implement as well and can be grateful and that this can help (laughs) even if we can't solve that big existential crisis they're having immediately. Yeah. Yeah. So that you've a couple of times then raised the prospects of becoming more patient. So let's say we're convinced. It sounds like this could be a good thing. It could in fact be a virtue worth wanting. It could be good for our social lives together. It could be good for our individual lives, all of that sort of stuff. What can people do? How do you become more patient? It's not easy. (laughs) It requires patience to have a lot of patience is a famous quote. And it does. It's not something you can snap and have overnight. But Our research suggests there are strategies that we can implement to help people become more patient. So an easy way I like to talk about this, even though it's not an easy process, is the identify, imagine, and sync steps. So these three not so easy steps (laughs) is what we can call them. So first, it's important that people actually identify what they're feeling when they're in an a waiting situation or suffering or frustrated, their goal pursuit is being inhibited, basically. Just identifying what emotion it is that you're feeling. Patience is not suppression. It's not saying, I'm angry, I'm just going to stop. That does not work. (laughs) And that's not what patience is. Patience is saying, okay, my initial reaction, I'm really angry right now, or I'm really sad, or I'm really afraid or anxious. What is this primary and maybe secondary emotions that are happening. And to identify that and not necessarily have judgment of it, but just to say, okay, this is what's going on. And then what we like to talk about is then start using your imagination to think about the situation in a new way. So the fancy word for this is cognitive reappraisal. And there's many studies showing that cognitive reappraisal is one of the most effective ways to regulate our emotions. So thinking about it from another person's perspective or thinking about the bigger picture, many parents over the pandemic year plus, (laughs) however long it's been, okay, now we're suddenly having to homeschool children (laughs) while um, also doing full-time jobs and not being able to see anyone. There's a lot of negativity in this suffering. And maybe we actually have people we know who are sick, right? So there's lots of suffering here. But taking kind of each particular situation and reappraising it. One way people reappraise is finding benefits. All right, I have a lot more time with my child. This is actually a gift. (laughs) It's a hard one. And not trying to say it's not frustrating or that it's not making us angry or sad or whatever it is, but saying, now, this gives us a new opportunity to grow our relationship in this way. Or even, wow, this is a great opportunity to develop my character strengths. That's my refrain <laughs> this whole year is get another opportunity to work on my patience. And then that leads to really this third step of syncing. And here I mean sync with your purpose. So we need a compelling reason why (laughs) we are suffering or waiting or bearing under this frustration. And I think this is actually where we often go awry in our culture is we try to just use 
these nifty psychological tools of, okay, I'm going to reappraise or I'm going to think positively, but you need something deep and strong to latch onto. And we like to talk about creating a narrative that supports meaning of suffering. And so for many people, this is their religious faith and a view of what God is doing in the world and how for many Christians, God's suffering (laughs) and his suffering on the cross and that there's a kind of connection with Christ and joining in that suffering. But this isn't a step that only works for Christians. I think many people can cultivate meaning systems that really provide how suffering is meaningful and what use it has and how to make sense of it and how a community can join in to do this together. And I think that's a key piece of this narrative is it's not just mine, (laughs) but there's something shared. And I can tell this story of how to make sense of the suffering and hardship with others. And so by connecting the emotion you're feeling how you can imagine a new way of the situation and then connecting that to your purpose can really energize you to keep doing it over and over again. We can think about a frustrating child, right? I have a four-year-old <laughs> when she is having a hard time or having a meltdown. It's one thing to one time <laughs> be able to stay calm, talk her through it, provide appropriate discipline and boundaries and love at all the same time, but to do that every day or during lockdowns this last year, every hour as we're with each other, every single hour, that requires that purpose to really keep you going and to consistently remind yourself of how regulating your emotion and being patient solves um, a bigger goal and contributes to something beyond yourself. That's really interesting and thing one can imagine doing, even though, like you said, it's not easy steps. I feel like I need to ask at least one kind of skeptical question, though. So cognitive reappraisal, it does sound like thinking positively, right? And it raises the question for me, I I suppose it's got two parts. On the one hand, for it to work, how strongly do you have to believe the new appraisal? Because it, it doesn't seem to be the case that we can just switch our beliefs on and off. So if we're convinced that a situation is one way, um, saying, imagine a, a different possibility, does it give you any traction if your imagining doesn't have a lot of epistemic teeth, if you don't think it's true? Yeah, I think you need to find something with epistemic teeth. <laughs> and this is why having that meaning system in place that actually gives you something that fits is so important. So I think there's some nuance there. Is this something you can rationally (laughs) endorse and know? And then do you feel it emotionally? Those are different. If you can at least rationally endorse it, it might still help (laughs) to take that viewpoint and try to adopt it. It might not fix it immediately. And this is, again, where other character strengths start to come into play and you need that unity of the virtues. So like gratitude, which I know is a virtue you're interested in as well. That's a very common way of reappraising is trying to find benefits, even in the midst of something horrible. And I can tell you, I've had many a walks with my husband this last year, right? Walking is the only thing you can do. He runs a nursing home. So as you can wow. imagine, he's the nursing home administrator. It's been an incredibly difficult year yeah. where 40% of our deaths are happening with nursing home residents with COVID-19. We were facing some really significant challenges as a family. And some days... <laughs> We'd be starting with lament. And I think that's where identifying the emotion and allowing it yourself to experience it without some of that judgment is important. So you can't rush through that step. So some days we would just be talking about how hard this is and how angry or sad we were. We were up close with it. But at one point in the walk, we'd always be like, okay, but what are we grateful for? And it'd be so hard to do. (laughs) Like I'm not in the mood, but we found that practice still helped reorient ourselves just slightly. And you can hold the sadness and the anger with that at the same time. And I think that's allowing to have multiple emotions at once. And, um, but if you make a habit of trying to reappraise, it does become effective, even if you don't feel it in the moment, but it does have to be spaced on something real. It can't be like, COVID's actually a good thing for the world. Like those are not the reappraisals that will work. It's that 
this is an opportunity for us to love and to share in the sufferings of Christ, or this is an opportunity um, for us to put the needs of others ahead of ourselves. And this is helping us grow character. That's something true, still not very fun, (laughs) but it just helps a little bit with being patient and finding the meaning there. Right. And in examples like that, it seems possible that but that's not all this is. It's not necessarily a global reappraisal, but it can be less like this isn't A, it's B, so much as this isn't only A, it's Yes, this is also B. B. Yes, I think that's a great way to put it. And sometimes the reappraisal is even just some distancing. (laughs) So we know in psychology, just providing some psychological distance. So talking about it, talking about yourself in the third person, actually can do this. So really weird. <laughs> just re-narrating the story of Seth was doing this and my husband's name is Seth. Let me talk about it as if I'm outside myself and just getting some psychological distance and perspective can actually attenuate the emotional response. I actually think this is why parents are constantly talking about themselves in the third person. <laughs> I haven't done a study on it, but I do it all the time. Mommy is not happy right now. (laughs) Mommy is having a hard time. You need to be, I do it. And I'm like, I think it helps to regulate in that moment that I'm not angry. Mommy is in this role. And it provides that psychological distance that just makes it a little bit easier not to get caught up in the emotion. (laughs) That is fascinating. I Uh I also do that on a regular (laughs) basis. I'm wondering at what point my children will age out of. Exactly. It it has to stop at some point, right? (laughs) It sounds ridiculous. And every now and then, especially with work and life being so integrated, I'll start to do it like in a meeting with my lab and I'll be like, whoa, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) So let me switch out of third person mode. (laughs) It's context specific for sure. Mm -hmm. So you used in in your personal example, the kind of practice of stopping and saying, so what are we grateful for? And it seems to involve a kind of commitment that there will be something to be grateful for. And I'm wondering, this is like a little on the personal side, but how does it make sense for you to ask that question? Where does that commitment that there is something here to be grateful for come from? And I think from us, it comes from our faith, our belief that there is a God and that despite all the sufferings, there is still goodness in the world. And that God is still at work and that in the end, there will be renewal and restoration of all things. And that despite all of the horrible things that are happening, something good is going on right now that God is working. And it's hard. It's very hard um, sometimes to hold fast to that. And I think that's where a lot of our spiritual practices really scaffold that (laughs) and provide those reminders in a tangible way that there is something to be thankful for, whether it's practicing communion, where you physically receive the body and blood of Christ. You have something tangible you're doing. It reminds you that, ah, I always have the gift of our salvation um, and our belief in God's um, work of restoring and saving humanity. That's always there. It's a constant even when everything looks horrible right now. And that's why with the identify, imagine, and sync, that syncing with your purpose and with your story is so essential. And that's where I think in American culture, we've lost our way a bit. Just generally, we don't have a lot of strong narratives that support the meaning of suffering. And even in our many of our Christian congregations and different denominations of Christianity, I think sometimes we've lost track of that conversation and focused only on <laughs> the winning that we see God doing and say, actually, blessed are those who are poor and who are suffering. Right? I think sometimes a health, wealth, and prosperity gospel, which is very easy to slide into, leaves us a anemic in this regard. And we really struggle then when we have a year like we've had with the pandemic, Um, more than a year now. (laughs) But we we were like, oh, no, what do we do now that we're all suffering together? This shouldn't be happening is the response instead of this is a part of life. We're prepared and ready to deal with this. So I wonder if as we come to the conclusion of our, our conversation, you might step back again. We started a little bit about the cultural relevance of patients. And if you might 
reflect a little bit on the existential relevance. Why does patience matter to you? What is it about patience that helps fill out your sense of what makes life most worth living? Yeah. The first thing that comes to mind that love is patient. I think as my personal faith and rooted in Christianity is really about loving God and loving others. And that I think the fact that patience is first listed in the first Corinthians passage is I'm probably biased. Of course, I want to think that means it's more important, but I think it really is necessary to do that, to love God and to love others well. You must have patience on both ends. I think it's very clear to see how we need patience with other people, (laughs) but I think we also need to have patience in our spiritual lives that answers might not be easy. (laughs) Understanding what is going on and finding meaning might not be instant. And many times as we took walks this last year, my husband and I, I don't see how we get out of this (laughs) or I don't see how the benefit I can find is very small right now. Like sometimes it's just, oh, we're grateful we have a house that we can be in. A lot of people don't have that, but being able to see the bigger picture and knowing that this actually does matter, that takes patience and believing that God really is doing things for good in the world. It doesn't always look that way. And so we wait and we hope that is the case. With other people, it's pretty obvious how much (laughs) we need to be patient to love them and to allow them to change in their own timing. A lot of times we want to construct, to mold people to do what we want. (laughs) But if we really want an I-thou kind of relationship where we really appreciate the other as someone who's related to us, but also a separate autonomous human being who has their own relationship with God and their own um, path of growth. We have to be patient and allow them to grow and develop at their own time (laughs) and not on our timetable. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think tying it to love, it draws actually back to that unity of the virtues idea, where from a Christian perspective, at least, it's plausible to think that those are all united in being in some way consonant with the character of God, which is best summed up, according to First John at least, in terms of love. And, and such that we could then, in being patient, we're being formed into the sort of love that is the love of God for the world. Second Peter 3 15 actually then speaks about the patience of the Lord at Jesus, I, I suppose, and it's referring to. And the, the King James Version uses a kind of old term for patience, which has been on my mind throughout our conversation, which is long suffering. And, and it says, the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. And so, again, I think there are these possibilities for a pretty deep theological connection that your reflections here have drawn out. So, thank you so much for that. Yeah. So a project, we have a grant right now from the Templeton Religion Trust to probe more the psychological, theological, and philosophical understandings of patience. Another thing I'm really interested, right, because as a person who's a Christian, I really understand it from a Christian perspective. But as a psychological scientist, I'm really curious how patience is experienced in other faith traditions (laughs) and what's shared and what Uh, might be really distinct about different narratives that can undergird patients. And part of our work with that grant is to bring theologians from Islam and Buddhism and other traditions and philosophers as well to say, is patience fundamentally the same thing (laughs) across these different traditions? Or is it actually the way these traditions uphold it, is it going to be psychologically distinct (laughs) from the patients we're talking about that emerges out of Christianity? And that's something I think is really fascinating and will be so important for us to articulate and understand and then psychologically research, because I can imagine in ways where there's similarities, but also um, ways where there's not. Yeah. And given the importance that you've given, that you've placed on that grounding of tying it to what matters most, it would make sense that you would wind up not with patience, but with patiences, depending on what the ground that you believe is underneath your feet is like. The topography of your world is going to shift the the expression of patience. Exactly. Um, And I think that's really important, too, as we think about 
the changing religious landscape in the United States in particular and thinking about what is the grounding that people have for their views of suffering and can we help people to cultivate firm standing in this regard? I think that's really critical as a society and to be able to do that from diverse backgrounds, but clearly seeing we're struggling with this <laughs> right now. So it should be interesting to just dis- figure out what we can discover <laughs> over the next couple of yeah, years. We'll look forward to hearing the results. As you yeah. Them out. Thanks so much for joining us today, Sarah. It's been lovely talking to you. Yes. Thank you. The question of patience is irreducibly experiential. It's hard to know much about patience without being inside the struggle to receive it. That's to be expected. It's true of all theological reflection. As Jürgen Moltmann once said, without living theologically, there can be no theology. So for our final installment in this series about patience, we'll be hearing from the Reverend Tish Harrison Warren, an Anglican priest and writer on faith in both its personal and public dimensions. Thanks for listening. For the Life of the World is a production of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture at Yale Divinity School. This episode featured psychologist Sarah Schnicker and theologian Ryan McAnally Lins and was made possible in part by a grant from Blueprint 1543, integrating Christian theology and the sciences to answer life's biggest questions. For more information, visit blueprint1543.org. Martin Chan and Nathan Jowers provided production assistance. I'm Evan Rosa, and I edited and produced the show. For more information, visit us online at faith.yale.edu. New episodes drop every Saturday with the occasional midweek. If you're new to the show, we're so glad that you found us. Remember to hit subscribe so you don't miss any episodes. And if you've been listening for a while, thank you, friends. If you're liking what you're hearing, I've got a request. Would you support us? It's pretty simple, really, and won't take much time. Here are some ideas. First, you could hit the share button for this episode in your app and send a text or email to a friend or share it to your social feed. Second, you could give us an honest rating on Apple Podcasts. How are we really doing? Finally, you could write a short review of the show in Apple Podcasts. Reviews are cool because they'll help like-minded people get an idea for what we're all about and what's most meaningful to you, our listeners. Thanks for listening today, friends. We'll be back with more this coming week. <laughs>